heritage breed pork chop that's butchered that week with a glass of Donhoff uh, Riesling from the Na. That was probably my first aha pork moment. I love heritage breed pork because it allows you to have a lot of a lot of very specific differences, you know, whether you're going with a Berkshire or a Duroc, there's so many different flavor profiles. I'm from Louisiana. There's pigs everywhere. Every October, there's this thing in, in our family called a boucherie, and the whole family gets together outside, and they, they butcher a pig, and they, and they take every, every piece of it to make something really brilliant. And I remember my father stirring the pot with the cracklings in it, and my mother making the boudin. And I was in a kitchen cooking, and one of the farmers brought me a sample, and I was just blown away by the, um, the marbleization, the amount of fat, and how it tasted different than anything that I've ever tasted before as far as pork goes. There's intensity, there's so much terroir to whatever the feed was, there's sweetness. It was beautiful. I was changed forever. Just a pork chop today is not the same anymore. You're looking at a large black or a Berkshire pig or a pork chop from a red wattle. A sommelier will pick a different wine to go with those pork chops if they're all cooked the same way with salt and pepper. All right, so the wine is a uh, Kola Ruprecht, 2009 Spotlace Trocken. It is bone dry, so really kind of more, more velvety and broad acid instead of that sort of like steely, racy acid from the nozzle. Tasting notes are, are awesome. Some nutty, sort of like walnut husk, sherry type notes to it. Some wet soil, wet clay. Also really outstanding floral notes. Some violet, some herbaceous, it's almost like dandelion in there as well. Um, and then some plum. So actually, uh, Smogain is a pork dish from the faults. It's, it's actually a pork belly stuffed with pork and spices and potatoes. So the outline of the vineyard looks like this dish. So it's, the dish is really similar like haggis. And then uh, 2009 vintage, crazy, crazy great vintage in Germany. Very warm in the faults. The faults on its own is pretty warm anyways. Um, so really big, ripe, bold. The world of white wine is so diverse that we just had an, an absolutely surprising and creative group of white wines in every city. Seeing 50 of the top sommeliers in the country get together and pick wines that went with Heritage Breed Pig, it was amazing to see the range of selections. When I think of philosophy and pairing wines, like when I get a chance to pair it on a tasting menu with Chef, that's when all these things like kick into gear of like why I wanted to be a chef and why you're a psalm, right? We're here to make that dish sparkle. There are certain laws of pairing, as in you, if you're pairing with something spicy, you go with low alcohol. Then there are rules, um, such as um, if it grows together, it goes together. Then there are approaches. Sometimes it's really hard to get like a table of businessmen in their 50s or 60s to drink Riesling. Um, let's say that you're at a steakhouse and it's 80 degrees outside and you've got a beautiful patio. And you would say, I would suggest Riesling and they'd be like, oh no, 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 no. Say, sir, do you like orange juice in the morning with your bacon and eggs? I believe the difference between a great pairing and a bad pairing is a few seconds of patience between sips and bites. I want acid, I want texture, um, and I want some sort of similarity within the dish and the wine whether it be a component of fruit or f for earth. I brought 2013 Domain Weinbach Cuvée Theo Riesling. These Rieslings from Alsace are a little bit higher in alcohol, more full-bodied, beautiful, stunning, laser-precise acidity, lovely minerality, and I think it's a nice contrast to a variety of different pork dishes. Riesling in Alsace is not what you think of with, you know, grandma or Aunt Sally ordering a glass of Riesling. It's not something from the, you know, from Germany that's lower in alcohol. It's going to be kind of a yin-yang sort of pairing, right? But hopefully my pairing will kind of zipping it up. Anything can kind of be snobby, you can find a snob in, in any realm. Wine can be intimidating, okay? Like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years, I learn something new every day. I think my mom likes two buck chuck and she's not wrong. 
and somebody who only likes Grand Cru Burgundy is not wrong either. I believe a lot of music is better than Justin Bieber, but I don't hate on his fans. Wine can feel snobby because wine has a lot of ritual. So whether that's a ritual of taking the cork and smelling it, pro tip, cork smells like cork, it's not going to tell you anything about the wine. To make wine, if you've ever worked a harvest, you will realize that it's the least pretentious thing you will ever do. You get dirty, you sweat, you don't sleep, you're covered in must, you're covered in dirt. The concept of a sommelier is pretty uh, difficult and maybe uh, unapproachable in the sense that like, you know, they're wearing a suit and a tie and, and you know, this is a person who knows more than me and I'm, I'm going to be intimidated in front of my guests by talking to this person. But at the end of the day, I think uh, most sommeliers, not 99.99%, we love wine and we want to talk about it. So just ask us. Every year the age range of people drinking wine comes down a little bit lower. And I think there's just cultural changes that are making things much more accessible. It's not about being only a beer drinker, only a spirit drinker, only a wine drinker. There's always going to be that part of anything that you enjoy. There's going to be somebody that, that thinks they know more than you or tells you you're not doing it right. Wine's just up to you. Enjoy it the way you want to. The wine's uh, a Nova Damas. Uh, it's a blend and it's exceptional. Very voluptuous for a white wine. You know, when you're lifting the glass on the nose, you really have these tropical notes, maybe some apricot a little bit of mango in there, and a nice dose of acidity, which should lend itself well to 25 hog dishes. Uh, it's from the Torlano Winery in Alto Adige region of uh, Italy. The geeky things, 60% uh, Pinot Bianco, 30% Chardonnay, 10% Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I respond to textures, and so the mouthfeel of this wine is just, you know, it's like drinking a, a Rubens painting, if you will. Anything that reaches back to the dawn of civilization, you know, we had wine before we had history. There are winemakers where after you meet them you can feel their presence in every glass of wine. It's a chance to be with someone else, to be in a different year, to go back and think to yourself, what was I doing in 2010? And wine is one of the most amazing translators of terroir. So essentially, what is in your glass of wine typically will be a great reflection of the region that it came from, or the vineyard site specifically. When you look at the concept of reflection, the sun comes down, hits the ground, grows a vine, which then grows grapes, and then the other side of the reflection, you know, you have to have somebody who caretakes for that vine, and helps that grow, but also catch the grapes and the product that comes from it. And then they have to get out of the way to get it into the glass. So you want it to taste like terroir. Kind of like what we're doing with the heritage pigs, right? You're getting a sense of place from those pigs because of where they were grown, where they were raised, what they were exposed to, what they ate, what they smelled. When you look at pigs, you look at the same kind of model. You see the sun come down, grow food that the pig will then eat. And then that pig then has to have a caretaker and that caretaker then has to process that pig and get that pig to a restaurant or a dinner table somewhere. When you're tasting wines, all you're doing is, is figuring out how the wine was made and where it's coming from and, and figuring out the story of that wine from how it tastes. You never stop learning. And you never can stop learning because you never can know it all. There's always something new, something that surprises you. Wine is always challenging for me. There's, I'm always learning more. It's smarter than I am. It changes, it grows. I change, I grow. There is really isn't what comes down to is grape juice, that it's on its way to become vinegar, and wine is just like the middle step to it, that we somehow capture that moment where it's almost a perfect balance of the two sides. It brings people together, it starts conversations, and uh, you know we all have to eat, so it's great to sit down around a table and share those memories and you know, sensations with uh, other people. But uh, at the end of the day, I think wine and food just go together. Wine makes food taste better and food makes wine taste better. Wine to me is uh, a wonderful addition to my life.